You need anything, Ma? I asked, getting ready to leave. My mother stared at the television. Another Hallmark movie was starting, and it had already sucked her in. It was Saturday night, and we just finished watching a romantic comedy during my weekly visit. I always brought her groceries and sat and talked with her if she was in a talking mood. This Saturday, she wasn't. The doctors had her on so many medications that her moments of lucidity seemed increasingly rare. Ma, I'm gonna leave now. Call me if you need anything, okay? Okay, she said, still staring blankly at the television. I bent down and gave her a kiss on the side of her graying head and then pulled my jacket on. The chill seeped into my bones as I stepped out onto the front porch, pausing to lock the door. Turning around, I stepped down the crumbling and tilted concrete steps. As I got to the walkway, I stopped and looked around in confusion. The neighborhood was pitch black. I couldn't see a thing. Turning around, I saw that my mother's house was no longer there. It had been replaced by nothingness, a black void. There's a mechanical thump and a bright light shines down on me from above. I look up, only realizing as I do that I'm sitting in a chair. How did I get into a chair? As I lift my hand to block the bright light, I notice that my arm is heavy. I'm suddenly drowsy, as if I'm just coming awake. The whole thing at my mother's house was a dream, a memory. It was Saturday night several months ago, back before everything changed. There's something around my neck, some kind of collar with a box at the front, like one of those bark collars for noisy dogs. Reaching up, I fidget with it, looking for a clip or some way to take it off. When I don't find any way to do it, I go to stand up from the seat. As I get to my feet, my head gets dizzy, and I have to sit back down. Hello? I say, looking up toward the light, which seems to be directly above me, some 30 feet in the air. My voice bounces around, sounding like I'm in some kind of large warehouse. Welcome! A man's voice booms out from all around me. To the deranged Doom Show, the dark web's number one game show. Rows of lights come on at the ceiling, prompting me to squint. I'm in a small square room without a ceiling. The walls are about 12 feet tall, but I can see up to the rows of lights much farther up. I am in some kind of warehouse. There's a metal door straight ahead, but there's no doorknob that I can see. There's a small camera just above the door, pointed straight at me. Turning in my seat, I look behind me and see a similar door there. It has a camera above it too. Meet your contestant, the man's voice says. Marcus Welton is 31 years old. He works for a major social media company, enjoys long walks down dark alleys, and is what you would call a problem drinker. What the hell is this? I say, fear burbling away in my gut as I become more aware with each passing moment. As I stand up, I get lightheaded again, but I manage to keep to my feet. Is this a joke? Kevin, that you? Marcus, your first challenge starts in 10 seconds. Are you ready? No! I scream. Let me out of here! I walk around the chair, heading for the knobless metal door behind the seat. A jolt of electricity travels into my neck through the box attached to the collar. It feels like I'm being bitten by a hundred fire ants at once. Not that way, Marcus! The man says. The other way! I stumble away from the door, and the shock stops. Breathing heavily, I reach up and look once again for a way to take the collar off. That only earns me another shot. The door in front of the chair slides open. Your first challenge awaits! I make no move. There's some kind of platform out there, with items on the floor. They look like throwing knives. Get moving, Marcus! Our viewers are waiting! Still, I resist. The collar shocks me again, and I find myself walking forward, going through the door which shuts behind me. I walk toward the edge of the platform, careful not to step on the six throwing knives lying in an orderly row a couple of feet from the edge. I look over the edge, seeing a grid of two-foot metal spikes sticking up from the floor 10 feet below. Some spikes are stained with what looks like blood. Looking up across the 15-foot gap between my platform and the next, I see there's some kind of large round structure over there. As I watch, the structure rotates, revealing one of my friends, Kevin. He's strapped, spread-eagled, to a large target, like the kind you see in magic shows. His mouth is taped over, but he's screaming into the tape, eyes crazed with fear. 
What the hell is this? I ask, nearly crying. This is your first challenge, the voice says. You have six tries. If you miss on all six, you go into the spikes. Begin now. There's a hum of machinery from behind me. I look back to see the wall of the room I was just in, moving slowly toward me, shortening the platform as it comes. Oh my god, I say, looking left and right at the walls and closing the area. There's no escape. If the wall behind me keeps moving, it will push me into the spikes below. I pick up all six knives, holding five in my left hand and one in my right. The target Kevin is attached to starts spinning clockwise. Kevin shakes his head as he keeps screaming, but I don't have a choice. The first knife completely misses the target, disappearing behind it. I take a moment to wipe my eyes clear before bringing the second knife up. I throw it, and it sticks into the target just between Kevin's legs. Yes, I say. I got it. Let me cross. That's two misses, Marcus, the voice admonishes. You only have four more, and not much more time. A glance over my shoulder shows me that what had been a six-foot platform is down to four feet. What do you mean, miss? I hit the target! I scream. No, you did not! You missed him! Try again, or into the spikes you go! Suddenly, it dawns on me what he wants. I'm supposed to hit Kevin. No! I say. No, I can't do that! If you don't play, Marcus, you can only lose! Another glance behind me. Three feet left. I look down at the spikes, a sick feeling settling in my stomach. I raise the third knife and throw it. It bounces off Kevin's leg, clattering to the ground. Only three more tries! The fourth knife sticks into the target next to Kevin's head. The wall is getting closer, under two feet left now. I take a deep breath, trying to calm myself down as I aim the fifth knife. I can see the wall closing in on me from the corner of my eye. Not long now. I throw the knife. It thunks into Kevin's chest. My friend screams and writhes, slamming his head against the wood behind him. But the wall stops moving toward me. Very good. Challenge one complete. A narrow wooden platform comes down from the ceiling on wires, creating a bridge between my platform and Kevin's. Drop the last knife and walk across for your next challenge. I do as I'm told. The platform sways as I walk across it and I get to the other side without incident. Kevin is still squirming, blood expanding on his shirt. I'm sorry, I say. I reach for him, but the collar buzzes again, stopping me. He screams through his tape as I walk past him. There's nothing I can do. As I go through another door and down a narrow hallway, a rancid smell invades my nose and prods my gag reflex. When the door I come to opens, I see why. Below floor level, there's a rectangular pool of foul, discolored water with rotting human remains bobbing on its surface. The stench is so bad, I can't help but vomit up what little is in my stomach. Welcome to the pit of previous players, the voice says. These four souls couldn't overcome the challenges, and so they rest eternally here in this lovely pit. Your job is to make it across without falling, using the platforms you see. The platforms he's talking about are placed at irregular intervals across the length of the pool. They're tilted inward, meaning the only way to get across is to leap quickly from one to the next. This one doesn't look too hard. I nod and prepare to go across, but the collar shocks me. Not so fast, Marcus, the voice says. We're missing one crucial ingredient. Something blocks the lights shining down on the challenge. I look up to see a person being lowered down over the pool, arms and legs held out by wires as he faces down, his head pointing toward my end of the pool. As the glare becomes less intense, I see that it's my friend, Dennis. Unlike Kevin, Dennis's mouth isn't taped up. You gotta help me, Marcus, he says. You gotta get me out of here. Let him go! I scream. The voice laughs. If you say so. The wires attached to Dennis's arms and legs go taut as they're pulled by machines in their respective directions, ganking his limbs away from his body. Dennis screams as the wires pull. I watch as his left arm dislocates from the shoulder, the joint shifting sickeningly. A moment later, the arm rips off, spilling blood down over two of the platforms below. Dennis screams louder as his right leg comes off. More blood splashes onto the platforms. Then his right arm comes off and the one remaining wire goes limp. 
letting him fall into the pool below, bouncing off the platform as he goes. His detached limbs hang at the sides of the room, still draining blood into the pool. Oh no, I say. Oh no, 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 no. There, now it's ready for you, Marcus. Better go before the blood dries. I scream, the collar shocks me. You have five seconds. Backing up, I prepare for the jump. I run and launch myself at the first platform, jumping off it and making it to the second and then the third before I slip in Dennis's blood and fall into the pool of floating body parts. Panic nearly causes me to inhale the wretched liquid, but I catch myself at the last moment. Determined to survive, I swim across to the other side and pull myself out. I get to my hands and knees, the stench of decomposing bodies infesting my skin. Retching, I crawl toward the closed door at the end of this challenge, wondering what will happen to me now that I've failed the challenge. Maybe they'll tear me apart like they did Dennis. Maybe they'll strap me to a spinning disc and make my friend Ryan throw knives into me. Ryan is the only one who was there that night that I haven't yet seen. Get your wits about you, Marcus! The voice booms from above. The next challenge awaits! Next challenge? I cry, spitting vile liquid from my mouth. I failed! Aren't you going to kill me now? Aren't you going to punish me for what I've done? There's a long moment of silence before the man speaks again. Our dark web audience has voted. They have taken pity on you, Marcus. They say let you continue the challenges. It's your lucky day. I would take full advantage were I in your position. The door opens and I see the next challenge. It looks like a large, twisty metal slide with high walls. I'm at the bottom of it. There are a couple of offshoots at regular intervals on the right and left sides of the slide. I'm not surprised to see Ryan strapped down about halfway up the slide, about five yards before the thing curves to the right. It's walls too high for me to see just where it ends. Ryan has his head up, looking down at me. Like Kevin, his mouth is taped shut. If you can reach your friend before the ball does, you can save him, the voice says. But you better move quickly, because the ball releases in 30 seconds. A robotic voice begins counting down from 30. 30. What ball? 29. I scream. What are you talking about? There's no answer. 25 seconds left. I run to the slide and start my way up. The walls are too high for me to grip their tops with my hands. And the track is too wide for me to stretch my arms out to create leverage on either side. Because I'm wet with the disgusting bloody water, it's hard going on the metal surface. There are a bunch of dents and scrapes in the surface, but they do little to provide traction. The first little notch is on the left. It's nothing more than a divot in the slide, large enough for me to stand in. I have no idea what its purpose would be. I keep going. The next divot is on the right, about 10 feet below my friend. By the time I reach Ryan, the countdown is at five. I see the latches over his wrists and ankles are all secured by padlocks. Where are the keys? I scream. One, zero. I'm afraid your time's up, Marcus. Better watch out. There's a massive metal clunk from further up the slide, followed by a terrible roaring sound. The metal slide vibrates as something comes shooting down from the top. I look up at the curve in the slide and see a massive spiked ball rolling and clattering down the slide toward Ryan and me. Suddenly. I know what the divots are for. Leaving Ryan to his fate, I turn around and half slide, half run down to the divot on the right, slipping into it just moments before the spike ball rolls over my friend, impaling him with a dozen or more of the sharp spikes on the ball. The thing rolls past the divot and crashes into a chain net at the bottom of the slide, which must have been erected after I started up. I peek out from the divot at my friend. His blood is moving down the slide in a river. He gasps, spewing blood out of his mouth before he stops moving. Fifteen, the robotic voice says. Fourteen. What now? I ask. Then I look behind me and see that the back wall of the divot is closing in. It won't be a divot for much longer, and I'm guessing the countdown signifies the next metal ball to come running down. I scramble up the slide, getting to the next divot just before the second ball comes rumbling down. Then I do the same again. I make it to the top, exhausted but alive. There! I shout. I made it! No more friends, no more challenges, right? Not quite, Marcus, the man says. There's one more challenge, just one more. The door ahead of me opens, and I trudge through. I come into a small square room. 
There's no other door that I can see and no defining features other than two holes in the opposite wall at just above waist level. They have scored rubber surrounding them, like the rubber in a sink with a garbage disposal. Only this rubber covers the entire hole instead of leaving a gap in the middle. Guess what's on the other side? And your challenges are complete, Marcus! The man says. And then I get to leave? I ask. If you guess correctly, you get to leave! I move up to the holes and stick my hands through, ready to get this over with. I'm too exhausted to play any more games. Besides, my best friends are all dead now. What else can they do to torture me? I reach through the holes feeling for the item I'm supposed to guess. There's a mechanical buzz and a bracelet clamps down on each of my wrists. Panic shoots up my throat and I try to pull my hands out, but they're stuck. My skin tears against the tough metal mechanisms as I yank. Something comes crashing down on the top of my right wrist on the other side of the wall. I scream in pain, knowing it's some kind of blade. It comes down again and I feel it slice deeper into my arm, cutting my hand off. Still I yank, unable to do anything else. Finally, my arm comes out of the contraption, but my hand is gone. There's nothing but a messy, bloody nub there. The blade comes down on my left wrist. My screams tear my lungs as I plead for mercy. After several more hits, I pull my left arm out. Both my hands are gone. I stumble back and fall down, staring at the bloody nubs, getting lightheaded. The wall with the holes in it lowers down into the floor. As it comes down, it reveals a familiar woman. She's pretty with dark hair, big eyes, and smooth skin. She's holding a bloody machete, and my severed hands are at her feet. She stares at me with unabashed hate as the wall fully retracts. She steps to me, raising the machete. You need anything, Ma? I asked, getting ready to leave. My mother stared at the television. Another Hallmark movie was starting, and it had already sucked her in. It was Saturday night, and we just finished watching a romantic comedy during my weekly visit. I always brought her groceries and sat and talked with her if she was in a talking mood. This Saturday, she wasn't. The doctors had her on so many medications that her moments of lucidity seemed increasingly rare. Ma, I'm gonna leave now. Call me if you need anything, okay? Okay, she said, still staring blankly at the television. I bent down and gave her a kiss on the side of her graying head and then pulled my jacket on. The chill seeped into my bones as I stepped out onto the front porch, pausing to lock the door. Turning around, I stepped down the crumbling and tilted concrete steps. I walked down the street to meet Kevin, Dennis, and Ryan at the bar. We drank and played pool and talked about approaching women, but none of us did. We all got good and drunk. When the bar closed, we all piled in Kevin's car and started toward Dennis's house, where he had some extra booze. As we turned onto Washington Street, I spotted a woman on the sidewalk, walking alone. My three friends spotted her as well. Kevin slowed the car as we came up next to her. Dennis leaned out the front window. Need a ride, beautiful? She looked at us, disgust clear on her face. No. Come on, it's cold out, Kevin said. Hop in, we'll keep you warm. There was no response. She turned her head forward and kept walking. She was pretty. Dark hair, big eyes, smooth skin. What's your name? I asked from the back passenger window. She ignored me. I felt a sudden flare of anger. It's a simple f-ing question. What's your name, you stuck up f-ing? She started walking faster. Pull up ahead of her, I said. Kevin did what I asked without question. As I jumped out of the car, the woman turned around to run but she was wearing heels and I wasn't. I caught up to her and slapped a hand over her mouth as she screamed for help. Then I dragged her back to the car. It wasn't something we'd planned, not something I'd ever done before, but we all took our turn with her. The next day, it seemed like a bad dream, like something that hadn't really happened. None of us talked about it, but I kept waiting for the police to arrive and arrest me, only they never did. Now I know why. Please, I say to the woman, blood still pouring out of my wrists. She says nothing as she raises the machete higher, just like I said nothing when she pleaded with me that night. She's already cut off the hands that grasped her, pulling her into the worst moments of her life. But now she's going for another offending body part. She slams the machete down into my crotch. 
This time, I can't scream. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video.